This morning we'll continue our exploration of the Heidelberg Catechism, and we come to Lord's Day 11, which is found on page 212 of the Forms and Prayers book. 212, we're looking at Lord's Day 11 together. Questions 29 and 30. And I'll read the question, if we can respond together, uh, reading the answer uh, in, in unison. Question 29 asks, why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because he saves us from our sins and because salvation is not to be sought or found in anyone else. Do those who look for their salvation and security in saints, in themselves, or elsewhere, really believe in the only Savior, Jesus? No. Although they boast of being his, by their actions they deny the only Savior, Jesus. Either Jesus is not a perfect Savior, or those who in true faith accept this Savior have in him all they need for their salvation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God and that you speak to us again this morning. We pray that your word would be effectual in our lives, that it would accomplish everything that you have for it to accomplish. We pray that you would conform us more and more to the image of our glorified and risen and ascended Savior, Jesus. May we hear you more clearly, follow you more nearly, and love you more dearly every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, this afternoon, we're going to look at this uh, catechism question, Heidelberg 11, which is really dealing with the name of Jesus. And if you ever want to have a conversation stopper on an airplane, then you can sit down with someone and say, I sell whole life insurance. Would you like to buy some? That will probably end the conversation. Or you could say, let me tell you how to make a million dollars a week from home working part-time with no sales. That might be a conversation stopper. And also, if you say, I believe in Jesus, let me tell you about him. People often react to those things very differently. It's a conversation stopper. In our days, people love religion. They even love spirituality, but they do not love a sovereign God, and they do not love a particular God Jesus. And yet scriptures tell us that there is salvation in no other name, no other name under heaven by which one must be saved than Jesus. Our catechism here is really unpacking what we confess in the Apostles' Creed. In the past couple Lord's Days have dealt with what we confess about God as our Father and the creator of heaven and earth, and now it's turning to Jesus. And it starts off by saying, why is the Son called Jesus, meaning Savior? Quite simply, because he saves us from our sins and because salvation is not to be found in anyone else. We begin with the name Savior even in our, the Apostles' Creed because uh, the Creed does and the Catechism does and Scripture even does, introducing us to who Jesus is. We're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew in a moment where this is the divine name given from the Heavenly Father told to name his Son Jesus. Jesus really speaks of his name. It tells us something about who he is. He is the Savior. Christ speaks of his deity, uh, I'm sorry, his title, which we're going to look at next week, Lord willing, and Lord speaks of his deity. So sometimes we run all these things together and think they're all the same. Jesus is his name, Christ is his title, he's the Messiah, and Lord speaks of his deity and authority. So we want to look specifically this morning at the name of Jesus in two ways. First, we'll look at the reality that Jesus is named by his Father. And secondly, we'll look at the fact that salvation is only in the name of Jesus. So the first thing we want to look at is that Jesus is named by his Father. And second, that salvation is only in the name of Jesus. So first, we realize that Jesus is named by his Father. It's really a divine birth announcement. Fathers rejoice in naming their children, as do mothers as well. As a matter of fact, last week I got a text from Reverend Borvin telling me that the baby was born and telling me the name. It was, uh, it was great. It was delightful to be able to receive this announcement of the birth of the baby and the name of the baby. And in Scripture, in particular, names tell us something about people. They reveal something of the character. Parents take time to consider and discuss the names of their children. 
You would be surprised if you found a person just kind of being rolled into the maternity ward just about ready to give birth and they've given no thought over the past nine months to what the name of their child would be. It happens. There's actually a family down at Santee that said on the way to the hospital, they still hadn't picked a name and the song Sarah by Toto came on the radio and they said, Sarah it is. And that's how they named their daughter. But that's unusual. Usually there's been lots of thought about it and because you want the name to reflect something about the child or your family or what have you. And here we have a birth announcement. The father, God the father names his son. He tells them what, to, what we ought to call him. The almighty God who we confessed earlier in the creed purposefully, intentionally, and communicatively tells us what to name his son. Look, if you will, at Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus." Quite a simple story. We could look at it more in depth, but I, for the purposes this morning, I just want to highlight that an angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord comes and tells Joseph what to name the son. The father is sending the messenger saying, this is the name that you will call his name Jesus. Why? Because it means the Savior. And the reason why he's coming, the person who he is, his identity, his mission, Everything wrapped up about him is that he will save his people from their sins. This is a divinely given name by the Father that you can rightly recognize Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the one who forgives our sins. He's the one who we trust in. He's the one whom we call upon. It's also fulfilling a prophecy in terms of Isaiah when there will be a virgin birth, and this is how you'll know. And you shall call his, Emmanuel, his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. So this person, Jesus, is God with us. He is Emmanuel. He is the Savior. He is the one whom we call upon. There have been 400 years of silence in Scripture from Malachi up until the birth of Jesus. And now all of a sudden there's a cacophony of sounds and announcements, whether it's to Mary or to Joseph, to Elizabeth, to Zechariah, to the shepherds. Just don't want to miss it. This is the one. Something new is happening on the stage of history, of fulfillment. Don't miss it. And here we have a proud papa, if you will, announcing, this is my beloved son, the one in whom I'm well pleased. His name is Jesus. He's the savior. He's the one who forgives his people from their sins. He's the one who delivers salvation. The name carries with it the character and the purpose and the mission and the authority, the identity of who he is. He is Jesus. He's the one whom we call upon. The second thing I want to look at is not only is uh, he named by his father, but we recognize that there is salvation in no other name than Jesus. This is where we want to spend a little bit more time. Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read a little bit longer passage just because I want you to hear throughout how many times the name Jesus is used, 
or how many times it says that something's done in the name of Jesus or in the name. Just want to highlight that. We mostly want to focus on the end of the story, but hear the whole story because it's pretty remarkable. In a nutshell, it is about Peter and John were going to the temple and they end up healing this uh, man who is lame and he's up and about and he's rejoicing and praising the name of Jesus for being healed. And the leaders want him to be, James and uh, Peter and John to be quiet and stop using the name of Jesus. All the while, the guy's running around them, you know, praising Jesus. And he's just like, please stop using this name. They just want him to stop. And the, the apostles will not stop, of course. But we want to hear this whole passage. Just listen. It's a delightful story about how many times the word Jesus or in the name of is used. And then we'll focus particularly at the end on what happens uh, when, the, uh, when the leaders try to silence the apostles. But hear the whole story. It says now, starting in chapter 3, sorry. Acts 3. Now Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping, he up he stood, and he began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, people utterly astonished, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us? as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets, that this Christ would suffer, and thus he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will rise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to the prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and thus who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servants, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came, up, came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, uh, with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had sent them, set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power 
or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and which has become the cornerstone. And there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given by which men must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called to them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were worshiping God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So far the reading of God's holy word. This is just such an amazing story, isn't it? It'd be one of those days in scripture that you just love to be there and to see this whole thing unfold. And here is really a trial. Uh, the, the apostles are going to be put on trial. So I just want to look at three things briefly. The arrest, the hearing, and the judgment, just like many trials unfold in our day. The arrest, the hearing, and the judgment. First, there's an arrest. There's a whole group of people that are aligned against Peter and John. It lists the priests and the captain of the temple, the temple guards, the Sadducees, the high priests, mentioned by name, rulers and elders and teachers of the law. And they were all greatly annoyed because there was a threat to their authority, to their influence, to their power. Their power and authority was being disarmed and uh, dis, uh, unthroned by Jesus and by his teaching, by his message, by his apostles. They were concerned because he was teaching the people and he was proclaiming resurrection uh, in the name of Jesus. And this was offensive to them. Some of them didn't believe in a resurrection at all. Almost all of them believed in a resurrection at the end of the, many of them believed in a resurrection at the end of the day. But they were announcing that Jesus had already been raised from the dead and that anyone who believes in him would have resurrection life now both spiritually and then at the end. And they just wanted this to stop. They did not want them talking about Jesus being raised from the dead, and they didn't want them telling people that they too can be raised from the dead in Christ. They had actually hoped that by killing Jesus, that Jesus and all of his, quote, nonsense would have stopped. But it didn't. It actually was increasing more and more. Because after Pentecost... When the apostles were anointed and 3, 000, the, the Holy Spirit fell on 3,000 people, they just kept on going out and sharing this message, and more and more people were coming to know the Lord. So what they had hoped was going to end by killing Jesus is actually growing, this whole movement, if you will, because they can't stop him. They can't stop Christ. They can't stop the word of God, and he has been risen. So they seized Peter and John suddenly and they threw them in jail for the night and they called them before an impressive array of rulers and leaders and authorities, which could be pretty intimidating. If the setting would be like appearing before the Supreme Court today. We can often be very intimidated, can't we? To be able to speak the name of Jesus in difficult situations. I was talking about just doing it on a plane if someone asks you a question or whatever. We sometimes, I must admit, I sometimes fear the mockery or the shame or the laughter or the estrangement or being labeled a zealot or a fanatic or a freak for being in Jesus, believing in Jesus and believing that he is the only way. 
Imagine being called in front of the leaders of the land and being told, you have to stop saying this. And here, they end up proclaiming Jesus in that setting. They don't cower from it. They actually proclaim the gospel, the good news of Christ, to those who are even accusing them. Note that many who had heard the word believed. 5,000 people. Don't let this pass, beloved. Even in light of our earlier sermon this morning, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And here, Peter and John had just been out proclaiming the word. It fell on different kinds of soil, didn't it? 5,000 believed. Many others got harder and harder, seeking to persecute and prosecute Peter and John. But many believed, 5,000. Note the contrast between the groups. One group of people was seizing him, arresting him, and trying to silence him. And the other, it says, is praising Jesus. Imagine this going on at the same time. One group is singing praises to the Lord, and the other group is trying to silence them. This is the conflict, isn't it, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman until Christ returns, in which case in glory there will only be praising. No conflict, not in the context of a war anymore. And another group is believing unto eternal life. Like we said earlier today, they had all heard the same message. They had all seen the same signs. Some believed and some didn't. Ostensibly, they all heard and saw the same things, but some of them had been given the eyes of faith. Some of them had been given ears to hear. Some of them had been given new hearts. And it would have been amazing, brothers and sisters, to be there and see a man who had been lame for 40 years get up and walk. We could rejoice at that. What great mercy, what great power, amazing love and amazing power in the name of Jesus. But don't miss 5,000 people believed. The one man getting up and walking is a physical representation of the power of the word of God and salvation and release and healing that is in the name 5,000 people believed that day. How glorious and how wondrous that is. So that's the arrest. They arrest them for doing that. But then the hearing. Peter and John are now standing in their midst. It's the same group of people who sought to crucify Jesus. He's standing for the same leaders that said, do you want Barabbas or do you want Jesus? The crux of the matter really comes when they said, by what power or what name do you do this? In other words, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are going about and disturbing the people and bringing these things up and contradicting our teaching or our power or our authority or our structure or whatever? Who do you think you are? And so then they give their opening defense. And the defending attorney in this case is the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Because the Holy Spirit is the one who gives Peter and John utterances. Which is what he says he will do with us when we're called to give a defense as well. And also, everything that we do is in and through the Holy Spirit. We are in him. He indwells us. We are his. The courage of Peter and John in such circumstances is astonishing particularly in light of the fact that just 40 days plus a few, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Before the crucifixion, before the resurrection, before Pentecost, Peter had been asked by a girl out by a fire, and he said, I don't know him. He denied Jesus three times. Here he is in front of the most powerful court in the the land, and he's not backing down anymore. It's not, well, I don't know him. This would have been a better time to cower than before a girl around a fire, but he doesn't this time. What made the difference? The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and spending 40 days with Jesus. He had a risen, in, he had a redemptive encounter with the risen Christ and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Peter begins by addressing and noting the kindness of the act. Is he really on trial for healing a lame man? He's a covenant brother. We all know him. We've all seen him for the past 40 years. Every time we've gone to, am I really on trial for doing good? For raising or helping a lame person? We are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man and by what means that he was healed. So exhibit A in his defense is, 
This guy's walking around. <laughs> Want to know the effectiveness and the authenticity of my message? This guy who's been lame for 40 years is now walking around. Here's exhibit A. And the word that's used there when he was healed is also the same word as saved. And I submit to you it's meant to carry both ideas. He was physically healed, but he was saved. He was forgiven. He was receiving a time of refreshment in the Lord. He was rejoicing in the Lord. Not only in his physical healing, but in his salvation, Jesus is the one who saves. And he saved him, not only from his physical ailments, but from his sin. And notice when they asked the question, by what name do you do this? He could have simply just said Jesus. That's what I would have done, probably. Peter goes on to say, the one that you crucified, <laughs> right? He adds more to it. That now the tables are being turned because Peter had been on trial. And now it said, Jesus, the one whom you crucified. Uh-oh, now who's on trial here? <laughs> the tables are being turned here. It's not so much Peter and John that are in the dock. It's those who deny Jesus. It's those who crucified him. It's those who refuse to believe in them. He said, by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. So here's more evidence. I have the lame guy now walking around. I have the crucifixion of Jesus as a historical event and the resurrection of Jesus as a historical event. Here's my evidence. You want me to stop? Produce the corpse. He is risen. Thank you. He is risen indeed. This, is, this has changed everything. This is a game changer in history. This is a game changer in our salvation. That one died for our sins, but one rose again, having conquered sin, having conquered Satan, having conquered death. And then the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Peter and John at Pentecost. Here's all this evidence that they're mounting. Peter doubles down and said, Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and has become the cornerstone. Again, it's who's really on trial here? It's not me for doing good. It's not me for telling someone the truth. It's not me for in the name of Jesus, healing a lame man. It's not me for proclaiming the truth about that the Messiah has come. It's not me. It's you. For crucifying Jesus and denying the resurrection and trying to prevent that name, that Jesus, that Christ from being proclaimed and placarded before all of these people. His closing argument is that there is salvation in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which they must be saved. In other words, there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven. Imagine if Oprah was around in the day and Peter and John got invited to go on the Oprah show. I would imagine that people would just be delighted to hear the story about the lame man getting up and walking. How amazing! Oprah would be thrilled. The whole audience would be thrilled. It's fantastic. This guy was lame for 40 years and now he's walking around. And then when they got to the part about the exclusive nature of salvation in the name of Jesus, someone's going to cut that feed quick. Whoa, 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 whoa. We can't say that. We can't talk about that. We don't want to offend any of our listeners. We don't want to get into that. But it's that Jesus. It's that one. He's the one who saved him. He's the one who healed him. And it's not just that he's walking around. People would love the idea of the miracle, but the exclusive nature of the Savior behind it is offensive to those who are perishing. It is the very word of life to those of us who believe. The gospel is a rock of offense to some, and it's the very power of God unto others. The exclusive claims of Jesus are offensive to the world. When he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Is that intolerant? Maybe. But a better question, is it true? Is he the only way to the Father? There is no other name under heaven. It's not an exaggeration. It's not an overstatement. It is simply and profoundly an important truth claim. We do not do any good to anyone by trying to water that down or change that in any way, just like Peter and John did not water it down or change it there. 
No one else died for you. No one else lived for you. No one else was raised from the dead for you. No one else endured the wrath of the Father for you. No one else lived a life of perfect obedience in your stead. No one else gives his righteousness to you as a gift. There's salvation in no one else because there is no other Savior. What would you want to add to or take away from the work of Christ? Which is what the catechism is getting at. He is the perfect Savior. Could you think of anything that you want to add to it? Was any of it superfluous or wasted? No, he's the perfect Savior. He perfectly satisfied the wrath of God for all of our sins, and he lived a life of perfect obedience in our stead. And right now, he is at the Father interceding for us. Hebrews tells us he lives to do that. He is risen, and he's ascended, and he is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us that we won't fall away preserving us in the salvation that he earned for us. Religions other than Christianity fail because they stress salvation by works rather than salvation by grace alone. And it's not just by grace alone, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone, in Christ alone. There's no other salvation. There's no other hope. There is no other name given to us from heaven. So we come to the judgment, the Leaders give them a gag order. They basically tell them, stop talking about this. Note that it says they could not deny what happened. <laughs> this is the travesty of justice. They know what happened. They can't deny it. The lame guy's walking around. Everybody knows it. He's praising the Lord, and the crowd's doing it. It's not like, well, we don't know for sure. We don't have enough evidence. They're actually suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, just like Romans said, right? They know this is true, but we just want you to stop. Isn't that the way with Satan? We just want you to stop telling the truth. Because he's a liar. And he's been a liar from the beginning. And they charge the Peter and John not to speak in this name. Note that throughout this whole thing, they can't even bring themselves to say the name of Jesus. <laughs> they say, hey, stop using the name, the name, the name. They won't even bother to say it. And Peter and John refuse. They're going to go on preaching Jesus as the only hope of salvation because there is salvation in no other way. Verse 21 says, When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because the, the people were all praising God for what had happened to them. What a great scene. They're saying, please stop using the name not please stop. They weren't asking him nicely. Stop using the name. And they had to let him go because they find no way to punish them because people are standing there praising the Lord. <laughs> praising the name of Jesus. How wonderful. Jesus is doing exactly what his name indicates. He's saving. And he saves to the uttermost. Our greatest need is to be saved from sin to be saved from the wrath of God. And Jesus, although he is an example, and Jesus, although he is a good teacher, and Jesus, although he is a moral leader, is far more than all of those things. Jesus is our savior. He is our substitute. He is our sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 7, talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and how much better the New Covenant is in every way. It says, This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. In other words, he lives. He was raised from the dead. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He saves to the uttermost. There's no other name, there's no other authority, there's no other person, there's no other character whom we can call upon other than Jesus. And we have been baptized into his name. We bear the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so you have also been given a new name. It would serve better for my sermon if we were called Jesusians rather than Christians, but we're called Christians. 
But we're called Christians because we are united to Jesus. He is the one who saves us. And you have been given a new name. You are not your own, but you belong to your faithful Savior, Jesus. Body and soul and life and death, he's satisfied the wrath of God for all of your sins. He has lived a life of perfect righteousness now. And the same Holy Spirit that empowered Peter and John on that day is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you and dwells in you and will not allow you to ever be separated from the love of God in Christ. Amen? The Gospel of John ends this way. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We call upon the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy to us. We thank you that you have sent your own son, Jesus, which means Savior, to save us from our sins, to save us from your wrath, to save us from condemnation, and to reconcile us to you. And we thank you that Jesus is not a half Savior, leading us part way, and then we need to get the rest of the way on our own, but he saves to the uttermost all those who call upon him. From A to Z, all that we have needed, you have provided in Christ through your Holy Spirit. And Father, may we live in light of that, in that freedom, in that love, in that grace, in that mercy. May we be eager and willing to go and share with others, our neighbors as well, the good news of Jesus Christ. We know that people have different responses to it, but we pray that we would have the courage and the boldness and the opportunity to be able to share, or at least to invite them to church a true church like this where they will hear the good news about Jesus. They will hear about their sin and misery and they will hear about the salvation in Christ and that you would use that very means to bring them into your kingdom, to give them grace, to give them eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe. In Jesus' name, amen.